All right, so this will be the third video in this series. And the reason that I try not to do too many verses in each video is the same reason why I recommend Christians not to overread in their daily devotions each day. The point of Bible reading is not to cram in as much as you can each day. Okay, it's to take bits and pieces, a couple chapters, two or three chapters a day, and then to meditate and think on what you've just read. If you begin reading too much each day, you tend to overlook things, and that's what you don't want to do. So we want to take a little bit, examine that little bit, and then apply it to our lives each day. Okay, so let's get into it. Romans chapter one. We are in chapter one. We're working our way. We're almost finished. We're almost we're almost out of chapter one. Okay, so we're in chapters one, and this will cover verses 20 through 26, okay? Or, I'm sorry, 20 through 24. So let's get into it. Verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Key point, okay? So the thing that has always struck me or struck stuck out to me regarding this verse is where it says that God's invisible attributes are clearly seen. Okay, that word clearly means that there is no place for confusion. Okay, excuses related to lack of knowledge or revelations. There is no excuse. The sinner is totally without excuse. Now it says that God's invisible attributes are clearly seen. So the question is, how can God's attributes that are invisible be seen? Okay, so what so what would be some of God's attributes that pertain to the creation? Okay, one, God is omniscient. He's all knowing. Okay, he would have to be in order to create something that is all universal. The, the creation, it, it's, he would have to be all knowing to do that. Okay, number two, he's omnipotent. He's all powerful, in which he would have to be to create the universe. Okay, when the atheist when the atheist looks out at the world, all that they see has everything to do with intelligent design. And the reason humans cannot attribute that intelligence to mankind is because humans did not create themselves. We didn't create ourselves. Okay. It all points to a creator, God. Okay. So let's continue in verse 21. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Key point. Okay. Now, this verse is absolutely terrifying because it places blame with the sinner. So often we get into the habit of focusing on the sovereignty of God that we tend to forget about the personal responsibility of, of man, okay? So we've already covered why mankind is responsible. Now we are looking at what God does because of that sin. He darkens their minds and gives them over to their sins. That right there is the worst thing that could ever happen to a sinner, to be given over to your sins completely, to live a full life under the wisdom of a reprobate mind, okay? And then to die and go to hell. When you look out at the world, that's all you see, because that's what the world consists of. People with darkened minds that are not set on the things of God. Okay, that's absolutely terrifying. And if you are a, if you are a Christian today, you know what that's like, because that's what you were when you were lost. Okay, so praise God that we are no longer that. So let's continue in verse 22. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Verse 23, and changed the glory of God the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Verse 24, therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their heart to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Verse 25, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped, worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Verse 26, for this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Key point. OK, so it says that God gave them up to vile passions. Let's examine that. Sex is not a bad thing. OK, God created sex for us to enjoy. That's why it feels good. Okay? It's not bad. Paul makes it clear that sex is a gift from God. First Timothy four and first Corinthians seven. But God gave us sex to be enjoyed within his sanctioned provision. OK, to honor God is to do things the way he commands us to do them. And regarding sex, that's within the confines of a marriage. Now, in verse 26, Paul expresses how God gave the woman over to their vile passions, resulting in female homosexuality. The women actively made the decision, again, placing fault with the sinner and not God. It's important that we remember that, OK, to trade what was natural for what was unnatural. And because of that, God gave them over to that sin. Okay, so I hope 
this has been beneficial to you. I want to keep this one a little short. I'm going to be coming out with another video tomorrow. Um, but for today, we'll go ahead and stop. So this video has, you know, I the reason I, I'm doing this series is because, like I said before, I want to go deep into the New Testament. I want to really examine it. So I, I get so used to just reading through the New Testament twice a year, but I never really have the time to get deep into it and really look at it. And that's what I want to do. Um, right now, I'm reading through the Old Testament, working my way through. But I, I just hope that these videos can bring out the text to you as well as it does for me as I'm studying them. Because that's the whole point about this. It's not just to read through it and get through it each day. It's to take something from it, to, to examine it and take something from it. And that's what I try to do with these videos. Pull something out so that you can apply it to your biblical worldview. That's what this is all about. So I hope that you can join me in the next video, which should be coming out within the next couple of days. God bless. And I pray that you have a great day. Since Jesus, in every respect, has been tempted as we are, does that mean he was tempted with homosexuality? You know, um, this, this statement, tempted in every respect as we are, yet without sin, is troubling because there are a lot of things you could think of besides this one. So this, is my, I, this is a real difficult question for me. Um, Here's, here's way more, I'll come back to homosexuality in a minute, but I think some of my worst temptations come from situations I've created by sinning. Jesus never got into a situation created by sinning. Jesus never felt guilt. I think a lot of my temptations are owing to what I do with my guilt feelings. So how am I, how's he going to empathize with me there? So this, this is not an academic question for me. Here's, here's my best shot at what, what Hebrews meant when it said, tempted in every respect. I, surely he knows that Jesus didn't face in every objective kind of situation we face. He meant kinds of temptation, dynamics of temptation, and then the final answer for me is, on the cross, the sins of the world went on to Jesus in ways that are, I would say, incomprehensible. The, the, the temptation of homosexual behavior went on to Jesus at the cross. And he felt it. He owned it. He knew it. And he himself, in that moment, didn't sin. He became sin. God counted him as sinner, but he didn't sin. Now, I, I don't know if that's the best solution or not. I'm just trying to deal with the, the, the extent of sinfulness in the world and the complexities of temptation in the world. And Jesus lived a pretty narrow little life on earth. There's three, three years of, of ministry in a Jewish context and with, with the, so I would just say, in his life, things came at him that are more than we know. And on the cross, everything came at him. And he dealt with it in an obedient way. That's why it says the Father regarded the Son's offering as a fragrant aroma in Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. He looked upon his son not only as bearing the sins of the world and thus his own wrath, but he looked upon his son as an obedient son that he was very, very proud.